Hey everyone, so this is my new raw therapy tutorial. My previous one was kind of a mess, so I'm going to start completely from scratch and actually going to start with a new version of raw therapy. Um, so if you have no idea uh, where I'm coming from with raw therapy, it is a open source raw image editing uh, software. It runs on practically every platform I've tried it on, and it can edit every raw file I've put into it. Um, as well as any normal image files like JPEGs, PNGs, TIFFs, um, and is a non-destructive editor. So what all these things mean is that if you um, are looking to get further into photography, you've probably heard about raw image files. So these are essentially what comes off of your camera's sensor. Unedited, um, there's no real like set white balance data, the exposure correction hasn't happened. There's a whole bunch of things that will happen on your camera when you take a photo and save it as a JPEG that happened kind of behind the scenes. And once you have that saved as a JPEG, you really can't change those things too much because it's essentially just a set um, image file. A raw file isn't really necessarily even an image file. It's actually just the data off of your camera sensor. So you actually have to process it before you can actually do anything with it. So raw therapy is my favorite open source raw image editing platform. I actually prefer it over Lightroom with my uh, little experience with Lightroom I've had, um, just because of the way the software is set up and the way that it works. So this here is the Raw Therapy website. You just get to it by rawtherapy.com. So if you're on Mac or Windows uh, to download Raw Therapy, you just go to the Downloads tab and download the version of Raw Therapy that matches your operating system. All right, so when you start up Raw Therapy, you get this browser screen here. This may be familiar to people who use Lightroom because you can rank photos by a star ranking as well as color code them. And over here, you can filter by metadata. So actually when it starts off, this box is unchecked. So you can check it to enable filtering by metadata as the checkbox kind of indicates. And you can then check the criteria you want to filter by. So here I'm filtering by lens. You can change the focal length filter. So if I want to filter, say, 90 to 300. Something else about this file browser that's real important to acknowledge is how you actually navigate between folders. So there's this folders tab over here on the left-hand uh, side of this window. And you just double click on a folder to navigate to it. So something that's really important to note here is if I navigate to a folder that only has subfolders or only has non-image files in it, it just comes up looking empty. And to navigate to those subfolders, you actually have to use these drop down menus here. And double click on the folder you're actually trying to navigate to. All right, so when you found the image you want to actually edit, you can just double click on it and it opens this editing window. Up at the top, you still have a kind of a timeline file browser, which is great if you're doing, say, batch editing. I will cover that in a later tutorial probably. But for the, right now it's actually not all that important. We can just hide that. So when you first load your image, Raw Therapy has already done some exposure adjustments. For the purpose of explaining how all of this program works, I'm actually going to reset that using this button right here. All right, so this is essentially the image completely unedited. <clears throat> Your first step then is to increase that exposure compensation because this image is somewhat underexposed. I have a tendency to do that until you increase the exposure to roughly where you like it. To increase contrast, you either have this contrast slider here Or I have a tendency to use these tone curves, which allow you to make the darks darker, bring up mid-tones, and bring up the lighter parts. So what I'm doing here is the left part of the image is actually the darker part of the image as it's loaded, and then this here is actually what it shows up as. So if I bring this down, it brings the dark part of the image down. Right now I'm just adjusting the mid-tones. And then this second curve at the bottom is the same thing. It just allows for finer tuning um, of your adjustments. So 
here I'm bringing up the brighter parts of the image and reducing that adjustment for the darker parts which increases the contrast of the image a bit. So over here on the left you have your edit history, a histogram, so this is showing the overall luminosity in red, green, and blue channels in the image and their relative amounts for each brightness, so over here is the darker part of the image, over here is the lighter part of the image, and over here you have again like I said your edit history, so if I want to go to before I did that tone curve editing I click here, you can see the histogram is a lot more thinner in the middle, and if I click here, it's after all my edits with the tone curves. Alright, so over here in the exposure tab there's actually also this tone mapping tool. This is sort of like an HDR process with a single image. It increases the dynamic range, so the difference between lights and darks for small parts of the image. So as you can see it brings out details really well, makes the lighter parts of the image uh, and darker parts of the image really pop and be a lot more different. You can increase the strength of this uh, tool using the slider here. It actually has an inverse mode here that actually kind of muddies up the image a bit if for some reason you want that. Now a thing to be aware of with the tone mapping tools, it does increase the noise in the image. So that's something to be aware of, especially if you're shooting at relatively high ISOs and you're trying to keep that noise down. So over here there's also this Retinex tool. So what Retinex does is it actually attempts to make the image look more like your eyes would see it. So it tries to make the darks a little bit brighter and the brighter parts a little bit darker so that everything is more properly exposed relative to one another. If I turn that on you can see it made some of the parts of the clouds actually pop a little bit more. Kind of brought out the lights a little bit. There's actually several different methods here, so highlights really operates mainly in the highlights, usually brings them down a little bit if you have like really overexposed highlights. Low works mainly in the shadows, trying to bring those up brighter. So if you have an image where say you're taking a backlit photo of a person, that low method is a really good way to bring your shadows out, bring in more detail there, so that the image doesn't look as harsh. Uniform kind of edits most parts of the image. But I don't really think that this picture truly needs the Retinex all that much. So I'm actually just going to do uniform and just crank it down just a little bit. Now it does increase the noise in your image again, just like tone mapping does, so something to be aware of if you're dealing with like a really underexposed image or an image shot at a high ISO. Still, sometimes that effect is really, really useful. You have all kinds of options for Retinex here, if you want to fiddle with them. And then have a vignette filter. This makes the edges darker, just does vignetting. It can also go and make the edges lighter if you give it a negative value. This is decent for fixing vignetting on a lens, although there is actually a vignetting correction tool elsewhere in the program that is probably a bit better. However, for now, I'm not really going to fiddle with that too much. So there's actually a graduated filter down here. Just like the vignette filter, it darkens part of the image. Here it just darkens a rectangular portion of it, and it's feathered. If you reduce the feathering, you can actually just see the part where the filter actually ends. However, if you don't want to fiddle with that, you can actually click this button here to get up a big toggleable interface. So this, this here changes the amount of feathering. This changes its angle. So if you want a graduated filter on some side of the image, it's an option, and then you can drag it around using this middle portion here. This is great if you have a really overexposed sky, say. Here it actually darkens the tree a little bit more than I want it to, so I'm not actually going to keep it on. But this is a very useful tool. And this button here is present on anything that allows you to essentially go into the image itself and adjust the tool there. Very, very useful. And you just click on that little button there to hide the tool. Alright. 
So the next tab I like to go to, up here at the top, there's actually six tabs. So we've just been in the Exposure tab for now. I'm going to go to the Color tab now. So here the first thing you get is a white balance tool. You can use a spot white balancer to actually set a white portion of the image as white, which then adjusts the rest of the temperature and tint and everything else. You really want to adjust your white balance if you're new to photo editing. Uh, it's really important. Not necessarily so much in this image, which the colors are a bit more up for debate so much as like images of people where an off white balance can make people look greenish or make them look red or yellow or blue and it's really quite awkward. One of the great benefits of shooting raw is that you don't have the camera's automatic white balance as the only real option. You can adjust it however you wish and the, what the camera did isn't actually all that important. You can also ch pick a method here. So if I just want to click the sunny one here, adjust the white balance for what it thinks is good for a sunny day. I don't think that's entirely right. Click cloudy, makes it maybe a little bit too yellow. So you can also just use these sliders to adjust the tint and temperature of the image. You can see here you can make it way too green, way too red. And if you mess up, you can always go into your history here and then just bring it back to where it was before. All right, my next favorite color option is this vibrance tool here, which increases the vibrance of colors, obviously. If you're having some trouble with the white balance, increasing the vibrance is great because you can actually see how much you've messed up. It's a lot more dramatic. I'm actually going to use that now. I can see that's maybe a little bit too red. Oh, now it's way too green. Where was I? There. So this vibrance actually has options to protect skin tones, so the red tones and yellow tones in an image. The vibrance is actually turned off for them when you check this box. If you can see here that the golden grass there actually becomes a lot less golden when I check that. And then there's this link pastel and saturated tones. So if you notice there's this here, this allows you to choose the difference between pastel and saturated tones. So this the horizontal axis here is saturation. So this portion here is a pastel tone, so I can actually crank down pastel tones separately. You can see the sky is actually getting less saturated, but you can change that here. And then you can change the saturated tones and pastel tones separately based on the differences you've picked in this threshold. All right. So another great tool in the colors tab that I don't really use all that often just because of the way I edit is this HSV equalizer. And what this can bring up here is a saturation graph here, if I click on the saturation tab here, so that's what the S stands for, H is hue, and V is value. So here and under hue, I can turn the yellows green, for example, or pink, or whatever the heck I feel like. Under saturation, I can increase or decrease the individual saturation of a certain color. So here I desaturated the yellows. Here I really increased their saturation. And again with blue. This can also be used to create a selective color image. So if I want, if you drag the toggle off the screen, it actually just gets rid of it. And I can actually just drag down everything but blue, for example, which then just makes only the blues show up. You can reset that by, again, hitting that undo button there. And again, you can see this tool here, which we recognize in the graduated filter, which allows you to select parts of the image and then selectively increase the saturation. You have to hold down the control key when you drag 
otherwise it doesn't really do anything. So you just control and drag in Windows at least. So if I want to decrease the saturation of this grass, I just click there, drag down. All right. So that's the HSV equalizer. Very useful tool. So finally, as I mentioned with the noise, you can adjust all sorts of detail and noise factors in the details tab, which is this one here. So you can see here there's a bit of noise going on. We can click impulse to noise reduction to get rid of any like hot or dead pixels a little bit. Um, anything that's just kind of random colors, which you're not actually seeing a lot here. I tend to see that more in night images. And then just click general noise reduction to reduce the noise in the image. Increase the luminance to essentially flatten everything out. And you can increase, you drag up the luminance detail to kind of undo that a little bit. These are great tools if you have a really noisy image. Um, depending on what your edits were, you may have increased a lot of noise with tone mapping or retinax, or you may have just shot at a really high ISO and your camera is just not really high performing there. Anyway, very useful tools. There's also the sharpening here, which is turned on by default. You notice that does contribute to what looks like a lot of the noise in the image. I'm not sure if this is actually showing up on your screen. Um, if it's not, I really suggest looking at this at like 1080p or above. If your uh, internet connection can handle that. So what sharpening does is it does actually really bring out the details quite well, say like in these branches, but it also does increase artifacting. So you can drag this amount slider here to change the amount of sharpening till it kind of reaches a sweet spot that you're happy with. There is also a defringe option here. So often when you shoot images with a high contrast, you will have fringing around, say like tree branches are actually a really common example or really anything where you get these strange green and purple halos. So this defringe tool, you can just turn this on and go to this drop down menu here. Pull up an equalizer, it looks just like that HSV equalizer. Probably need to take a second to load right now. And you can pick which tones you want the defringe tool to get rid of. So if you increase the green, you'd be getting rid of green fringe. If you increase the purple, which is on by default, you're decreasing that purple fringe. Over here, you have the transform tab. This allows you to do things like crop the image. So you've got all kinds of tools for cropping here and all sorts of different ways to make it appear. So you have the guide type. So you can either have a frame, you can have no guide on. So if you see here, it just kind of is just a darker portion of the image and it's just highlighting it. You can also have a rule of diagonals, rule of thirds crop, which is great if you're, say, doing portraits and just want to center it properly. And you can also have a passport crop, which is really useful if you're editing a passport image. I actually did not know this was present when I was editing a passport, and it was quite frustrating. You can also just get a generic grid. And you can set your ratio here, so if you want to pick a different aspect ratio, we want to crop it in a square, say you want to upload Instagram and just want to crop it here, great option. And you can just click that little power button here to turn off your crop. So in this lens geometry tab, my favorite thing here is the rotate tool here. So your image is crooked, you can always fix it there. You can also select a straight line. So what this does it allows you to drag a line across part of the image that you think is straight. So here I'm using this little bit of ocean in the horizon. Click it and it'll rotate the image so that's actually a straight line. So it's either straight horizontal or straight vertical you can select. And that straightens out your image if it happens to be a bit crooked. 
you also have some perspective transforms if you want to change the perspective of the image a little bit. And you can load lens correction profiles from, say, Lightroom here, if you happen to want to do that. Correct distortion. So like if you have a really fish-eyed lens and you don't want it to be fish-eyed, you can edit that there. And that, for the most part, is the gist of editing in RAW therapy. So to save your image when you're done editing, you can click on this little button down here, which pops up with this dialog box. Down here, you can choose your file format. So JPEG, TIFF, PNG, or PNG. Your JPEG quality. You can choose what name you want to give the uh, image. You can also navigate to what folder you want to be in. So here I just navigate to the folder I want to be in, and I like the name, it'll just be a .jpg, just click save. Down here is going to be a progress bar showing the saving progress. This actually usually takes a little bit. Alright, and now it's saved. One thing to note about RAW Therapy is it saves your edited images with a .pp3 file as well. So this saves, these .pp3 files save your edits. Unlike in a program like Lightroom that actually saves the edits with the RAW file, it saves it as a separate file that you can actually copy to other images and do whatever you want with. Deleting that deletes your editing profile for RAW Therapy, so make sure that you have these files kicking around, even if they look a little funny, if you want to go back and edit the image again, tweak it a little bit. Alright, so I think that's everything. Thanks for watching.